Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Well, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. This is our final show of 2023. Hard to believe that. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work confronting business leaders and people today. And our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, technology, and people. Well, today is not just any episode, it's our year-end special, where we look back at the remarkable journey we've taken throughout 2023, and I can't believe how fast the year's gone. It's gone super fast, Ira, and as we say goodbye to another incredible year, it's time to reflect on the evolution of our discussions. So, you know, because you started GGG many years ago, when GGG started in the fall of 2018, we spent a lot of time talking about recruitment which led to a lot of conversations about HR technology. But my goodness, have we pivoted. The world of brain tech has become our new playground and how it is revolutionizing our approach to leadership, people management, and of course, how we think about the future of work. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just about the tools and technologies anymore. Uh, But this year, we took a deep dive into the very essence of employee experience. We, in the past, we talked about the strategies and the steps and how technology was impacting it. But this year, we really took uh, another look. A- and thanks to neuroscientists and, and quite a few of our guests who introduced us to uh, what, what's really changing, um, we shifted away from our traditional paradigms to uh, and took a look at many of the leadership and management myths that we believed to be true. And some of them you probably heard us share on the show within the last few years to find out that they, you know, they were little white lies, maybe. So uh, they, they weren't big, but they were little white lies. That's right. So we kind of took a little bit of a flavor of Mythbusters this year with some of that, with a lot of the guests we had on the show. And one of the things we talked a lot about was transformation and perception of once we what we once called soft skills. You know, the things that are often talked about in terms of vulnerability, authenticity, and love, they're not just buzzwords. They've actually emerged as true superpowers in the workplace. And to be honest, Ira, those skills are also quite possibly the only skills in the future that we have that AI may not have. So they're becoming extremely important. Yeah, oh, definitely. And speaking of superpowers, I don't know how many times we must have mentioned mindset. And, you know, certainly we talk about uh, growth mindset, but, you know, we talked about the adaptive mindset. We talked about a leadership mindset. We, we you know, everybody talked about, we talked about agile mindset just a few weeks ago. That's right. Um, but it, it's been a recurring theme in almost every episode. And, and that's been changing over the last few years as well. But it wasn't until our, our interview last week, our conversation, I want to say an interview, but our conversation with uh, John Gomes, uh, uh, and he really nailed it with his definition. And we're going to be talking a, a little bit about that in a few minutes. That's right. And how can we forget the giant elephant in the room also, the influence and impact of AI, especially generative AI. It's been a game changer. In fact, it's kind of odd to think this time last year, December of last year, we were just into month two of chat GPT. And, and all the craze around it. But it's now become woven into nearly every conversation we've had this year. And one other thing's become quite clear with AI. This isn't just a bubble. It's not just a fad. Um, this is the future. AI absolutely is going to become intricately involved in our personal lives and in our work lives. Um, and just thinking kind of out in the future, futurist Ray Kurtzville came out this week reaffirming some of his predictions around AI. So his first one is that he thinks artificial general intelligence 
will be here by the end of this decade. So by 2030. And for those wondering what's artificial general intelligence, that's when it's considered that AI will be able to do pretty much everything that a human can do. Okay, so that's by the end of this decade is what he's saying. And then artificial super intelligence, when AI will be able to do things beyond human thinking and reasoning, that's by 2045. So almost 20 years away. Um, so lots of change coming at us. And no doubt AI has been a big part of the conversation this year because of that. So as we look toward 2024, just uh, about 10 days away, let's use today's episode to draw from the past to inspire and help you, help us. And I include you and me amongst that prepare for the future. We're here to guide you through the journey. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the insights, uh, some of the laughs we had over the year. Uh, and but we, we've got to get ready for what what is going to be a roller coaster ride of memories and learnings. Uh, this is geek skeezers and Googleization, where we our goal is to bring extraordinary ideas together with practical solutions. So let's get started, Jason. How about we start here with a huge thank you to Googleization Nation and our listeners. We had a great year. And just to cap it off, last night I was notified by Good Pods that Geek Skeezers and Googleization was ranked 37 on the all-time uh, podcast list, all-time leadership podcast list, and 57 on the top management all-time list. Uh, we've had quite a few episodes made it to the top 10 over the course of the year. Uh, on Good Pods, uh, we even had it crack Apple's top 100 business podcast a few times. We've been on their their top 100 career list podcast uh, this time. And I know in Chartable, we've been uh, quite a few times in the top 100 as well. So uh, we the only reason we're there is because people are listening and uh, we appreciate everybody. Uh, so to get started on today's show uh, and talk about some of the things, I, I came up with an idea. Um, you know, everybody, David Letterman certainly made the top 10 famous. Um, I, I subscribe to Motley Fool and every couple of weeks they come up with, uh, each of their leaders comes up with a, a top 10 list comprised of five from each, from you and five from me. So if you had to pick five topics, or maybe we put them into five hashtags to represent this last year, what, what would your top five be? You got it. Love the David Letterman reference too. As a native Hoosier, it's still hard for me to believe that David Letterman, just down the street, not too far from where I live now, is where he grew up here in Indianapolis. Mm. So shout out to David Letterman in case he ever listens to this episode of Geek Skis or Googleization. All right. So Ira, here's here's my top five before we get into your top five. So for me, autonomy, freedom. What we saw over the last year was not just a push for freedom in terms of remote work, but what we're leaping into now is now that people got a little bit of taste of that freedom, they want additional freedoms. They want more flexibility in terms of when they're working, not just whether they're working from home, but what time of day, what shifts they're working. How about flexibility also in terms of who you're working with? I mean, you think back to school, Ira, and you probably see this even in your uh, your college classes that you're teaching now. Everyone wants to have a say if it's a group project in terms of who they're going to work with, right? Mm -hmm. And that there might be certain people you're like, I do not want to get stuck with Johnny. I know Johnny is going to be a <laughs> slacker. He's not going to contribute much to the group. This kind of stuff happens in the workplace, right? Even to the best of our abilities, getting people in the right seats, the right talent, doing the right things, this stuff still happens. So people are going to start wanting more autonomy and flexibility in terms of the structure of their team and who they're working with on certain projects. And then the projects themselves, you know, we're starting to see more employees say, hey, I really, I know I've got my job description here, but you know that little section that says in all other duties as assigned, I've got some ideas of some additional projects I should be leading or contributing toward. Um, and more folks are taking that um, initiative to work on things that they think align with them and their interests and their passions and their skills. So autonomy was number one on my list. Number two on my hey, list. Jason, because I know I'll forget yeah. this and because a light bulb just went on. 
you, you talked about at the bottom of every job description, it says and other and other responsibilities or some variation of that. That used to be the employer who put that in there for their control. Because it's like, oh, I might I might ask you to do something that wasn't included on this list. And I don't want to, you to say that's not part of my job. It seems that, and I'm not sure we talked about this or even thought about this before, but now that's actually for the employee. Because the employee is saying, there are other things I might want to do that's part that's right. of this, and I want to be paid for it. So just a shift in thinking of, it used to be there as a default for employers to basically say, hey, I'm going to ask you to do things and you just can't come back to me and say it's not on my job description because I'm going to point to bullet 14 uh, that says other responsibilities. That's right. Absolutely. And I'm actually, the reason I'm looking down for those that are watching is I'm looking through some notes here because I actually came across some research this last year from Deloitte. We had Deloitte on the show this year with, mm -hmm. with Steve Hatfield, uh, their global future work leader. But one of the fascinating things they did was they did some research on job descriptions. And what they found was 63% of work falls outside of the job description. <laughs> so all that, all that time that we spend carefully crafting these job descriptions to clearly articulate the roles and everything, things are changing so rapidly that even the best job descriptions are only capturing 37% of the stuff people do that's valuable. 63% is not captured. And that's why that section just referenced there, the other duties as assigned, instead of using that as a control measure, it's you may want to pay more attention to it because that's where most of your people are living. And that's where most of them are driving value for your organization. Yeah. So, so maybe, uh, Job descriptions will go the way of annual performance reviews soon. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Generalists, right? We, you, we've you, we both heard that so many times, Ira. We've both probably mentioned generalists before, but it really sounds like the future of work, you're going to have people that instead of just being in one silo, you're going to have super talented people that are doing lots of different things, almost akin to how a lot of lean, agile, entrepreneurial type of companies mm -hmm. operate. Um, and, and that that's going to be more of the, the generalist type of worker is what a lot of organizations will have. So probably so we'll be moving more away from job descriptions and thinking more about tasks and skills and it being a jigsaw puzzle and making sure you got the right people working on the right projects. So let's, let's keep going down your list. Number two for me was, and I promise we'll go quicker gig work. We just chatted with um, with the guys from Odeon Capital about this recently on some of the economic reports. One of the big things that's coming out now is there's a lot of data showing most people are working multiple jobs now. So all these indicators of, oh, the economy is healthy. Well, it's because a lot of people are working more than they ever have in their life. They're working multiple jobs. Um, and and that's, a, that's a challenge. The good side of that is it seems like we're moving into a future and Josh Dreen of Work3 Institute talked about this, where there may be more people who are super talented and skilled. They're just setting up their own shop and they're a free agent player. If you think about this like professional sports, it's like, okay, yeah, you want me to, to work on these projects for you? Okay, I'll do that gig for you. I'm going to work for another employer doing these things. And so there may be multiple income streams for folks that are super talented and I think we're starting to see just some baby steps that direction of people working instead of just one job with one employer. They may be doing that same type of work for multiple employers, or they may be doing multiple types of work for multiple employers. Um, so I think that was also a, a big trend. Any any additional commentary on that one, Ira? No, I don't think so. It, it, let's keep going because I, I cover some of that. and And then we have some clips from some of our uh, some of our guests that I pulled out way, way, I pulled out way too many. Because I didn't know how to stop. Uh, but uh, I think we'll get to some of these ideas uh, as we move in. You got it. Number three, workplace mental health. We talked a lot this year about the push from the federal government, um, the U.S. Surgeon General, about an emphasis on workplace mental health. Number four for me, intergenerational collaboration. We talked a lot about this with Lindsay Bacardo, Chip Conley that as longevity continues to improve for people, we now have five generations in the workforce. 
Um, we may potentially have six here soon. Mm -hmm. um, and so helping all those generations work well together is going to be really important in the future work. And then number five for me, um, we had some really cool brain science stuff. And Stephen Kotler from, from Flow Research Collective talk about peak performance and shattered some myths around just because you're in your 70s doesn't mean that you can't learn new things, do new things, or have unique abilities that people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s haven't developed yet. So thinking about setting up peak performance for everyone so they can get in flow and deliver their best was another one. So that was my top five. How about you? Number number one, and, and we, 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 we took slightly different approaches to this, but um, still the same, you know, similar outcome. So number one on my list was ChatGPT, and, and you started out with that as well. You know, it, it's hard to believe that it was just November of 2022 that it was introduced or made available to us. It's been around for a while, but just made available to us. And, you know, soon after that, they came out with it started with uh, 3.5 and I think moved to four and and, you know, huge difference there. Uh, but chat GPT seemed to um, kind of get integrated and, and come up in almost every weekly conversation. Uh, I just got off a panel discussion uh, with Ivanti, one of our, our GGG Unleashed partners, uh, and they just had the uh, closing end of the year panel. I moderated that with their exec with uh, some of their senior leaders, uh, Predictions 2024 and AI innovation, um, the new skills that are required, the, the new risks, the new opportunities that are presented, the new uh, how it's improving customer, customer segmentation, productivity and service. Marketing um, was probably the, the, the industry that was most immediately affected by ChatGPT, but it's just the beginning. And, and so it created opportunities. It exposed a lot of vulnerabilities. It's forcing, it's, it, 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 as it turns out, like almost all these technologies in the past, it's, it's not eliminating jobs. It's, it's creating new jobs. It's creating new opportunities for people. Um, so, and we're we're just in the beginning of it because ChatGPT is just one small form of AI. It just happens to be the one that's available to all of us. Uh, the second one, uh, I, I I called Mattering Matters. I, I did use almost as hashtags. So Mattering Matters, and uh, that's directly from uh, Zach Mercurio. Uh, Zach uh, was actually on our uh, podcast twice last year because we had such a, it, it was his, how good uh, he was. Yeah, I think his no, I think the March episode. I don't, I don't remember the exact date, but in the March episode, uh, w was our most popular podcast all year. Uh, from according to Spotify, uh, and I know there's different what different measurements, but um, yeah, it it was our our number one podcast and uh, mattering matters. I'm not, not sure we have to 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 go back into that anymore. Or I think that talks about your autonomy, uh, the intergenerational co uh, collaborations uh, that you mentioned. But uh, you know, people need to feel like they matter, and we've talked a lot about the why and purpose and and so forth in the past. But uh, he he summed it up. So I, I think. Over, over and over and over, uh, multiple themes from uh, Gabriella, you know, Kellerman uh, to uh, Paul Zak to um, so many others. I'm drawing a blank on some of the some of the guests that we had, not to slight them, but uh, that we just had so many good opportunities uh, that we, we talked about caring and compassion in the workplace, uh, even from people that we didn't expect it that you know the topics were completely offline you're talking about neuroscience and all of a sudden we're talking about caring compassion and empathy uh we had um uh uh i'm i'm drawing a blank on her first name uh bellamy uh just jasmine jasmine, jasmine yeah. yeah yeah um you know talking about a culture of love we had Re renee smith talking about a culture of love when when did you ever think we'd be talking about love in the workplace um you know we talked about trust in the workplace, we talked about vulnerability. We've, so, so many things, um, which led into the empathy revolution. Uh, I, again, I think a theme probably across three quarters of our of our uh, conversations this year. Somehow, it got back to empathy or walking in a, another person's shoes, and not just walking in there, but being able to to see the world from their standpoint. Which ended up last week, going back to John Gomes about mindset. About you know, mindset is understanding how someone else makes sense of the world. 
uh, mindset is make how we make sense of the world. So really, empathy is is starting to understand how other people make sense of the world, not just present them a new, better opportunity, but to but first they may be comfortable. The, the world makes sense. Why it makes sense to me where I am, regardless of what I'm doing, even if I'm beaten and downtrodden and at risk of losing my job. If the world makes sense to me, why would I take a risk and try something else? And so our job as leaders and, and certainly as hosts of this show was to help people identify some opportunities that are out there, uh, make it less scary, uh, provide a, a better roadmap uh, to be able to do it. Uh, again, and here, it, my, my next uh, hashtag or, or uh, trend was break addiction to certainty. And, and that's from John uh, uh, Sani. Um, he, John, you know, I first spoke with him in July of, um, I think it was July or August of, of 2020 in the heat of the pandemic. And he talked about people were addicted to certainty. And I have to go small clip of that. I don't have a small clip of that, but when he was on, and he's always one of our favorites, one of the most popular shows, when he was on in March, uh, he talked about our brains are familiarity machines we're just used to doing the same thing over and over again, and it's comfortable and it makes sense to us. So uh, I've got chat GPT, matter, mattering matters, empathy revolution, break addiction to certainty. And the last one, I, I really struggled with coming up with the fifth one, not because I couldn't come up with the fifth one. I had 10 fifth ones, <laughs> um, but um, I, I was playing a little bit of this. We've talked about purpose and this started to come out uh, again in some unexpected places this year. Uh, we we talk about it as the why W H uh, Y. I came up with an acronym for why, um, which was willpower, heart, and you. And focusing it, it really is about focusing on personal strength, personal passion, and individuality uh, that defines one purpose. Um, and and that fits into your autonomy. It's become much more important for for people. Uh, employees now have the upper hand uh, in the in the markets. And it's going to be uh, leaders, leaders' roles, and we heard about this from a number of people. It's going to be the leader's role to help people live, not only live their why, but sometimes help them discover their why. And that was dangerous in the past. It's like, why would we do that as an employer? Um, then they may decide this isn't their job and they'll pick up and leave. And yeah, that's the reality. Um, you know, but that also doesn't mean that they're not loyal employees because a loyal employee is going to raise the employee experience. It's going to create a better brand. They're going to talk about it and other people are going to work for you because you care about the people, which goes back to mattering matters. So they all seem to, you know, if we, if we, we had the old diagram, they all seem to center in, in the matter, in the middle, in the middle that people matter, humans matter. Absolutely. Ira, just, just to throw extra commentary on there. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Henry Ford who's attributed with this saying, but what you shared just triggered this for me. And I might butcher it a little bit, but the gist of it is, <clears throat> what if you uh, train someone on something, you invest all that as an organization, you invest a lot of money to train someone and then they leave. But the more important question is, what if you don't train them and they stay? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and your point about the why and, and, Employers being worried about, well, if we dabble in those things and we open their eyes to potentially it not being a good fit and they leave, like that shouldn't worry you. Like if it's not a good fit, you should be happy, you know, that they move on to something different and also happy for yourself that you may not have a burned out employee who's just going through the motions, but that you can then make sure you do your due diligence and find a better fit for that particular position, right? It can be a good thing for both sides when that happens. And I definitely think we're starting to gradually move that direction a little bit of there being a little bit less fear of losing someone and just understanding these are the table stakes. You know, the, especially the younger generations coming in, they expect frequent feedback. They expect to talk about things that aren't just work related and to be able mm -hmm. to be their authentic selves. These are the table stakes now of being able to, to have the best talent possible in your organization. So I'm happy to see that shift happening. Yeah, that's so that's so important because people, uh, again, when you first started to talk, the first thought that came to my mind, 
is that companies really managers and i want to say companies because that's almost too abstract but managers almost wanted their employees to be mediocre hmm. that they 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 wouldn't be wanted by other companies they'd want to stay um let's not provide them with the tools to make them exceptional let's just keep them mediocre and 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 again get that average employees because a, somebody was better than nobody um, that they had. Uh, and that's certainly changed be, for, for many reasons. Uh, the metrics have changed, the, the competitive marketplace has changed, um, but the, the, the labor markets have certainly changed, which uh, gr grave an opportunity for people who, who are, you know, companies, every ad, every job description, not every ad, but every job posting, as we're looking for self-motivated people who take initiative ambitious opportunity to grow and the first thing is that's not how we do it around here you know um you probably want to be ceo tomorrow you don't want to be you don't want to do that you don't want to say that around here you know let's put that on the agenda we can talk about that next quarter um it, it's everything's done to keep people where they are but except when it comes to performance it's like well you're just the b player you don't get the you don't get the opportunities and and now it's you know people just have opportunities to move on so you you lose your top talent and you keep your mediocre talent or worse you keep your underperforming talent because they're a body they're a warm body that's right place. so we we have we have so much to go through yet and i know um actually we've got uh, uh our good friend john burn uh john and burn uh listening here is throwing up some good comments and he's he he talked about he thanked us for the shout up to odian capital and that was one of my first videos um that i had so let's show up i pulled a couple clips so we, we definitely want to get through some of these let me go down my list i got so many here let me let me uh find them here uh i'll take that back um actually our first one as I move them around a little bit. Our first one's from John uh, uh, Sani, um, who, uh, we, we, as I said, we've had back a, a few times. He's always a, a top guest, and he, he's, he, has, he has some brilliant insights uh, that we like. So let's play this, and we can get a, a short clip after it, or a short conversation. It's not so much about the future. It's much more about the preparation for the future. And as human beings, we haven't been wired for this incredible amount of disruption and uncertainty ahead of us. So, yeah, I mean, we, we you know, we could, I don't know, I, I had so many videos that were the start of where we were, but I think that sums it up. I mean, and we're still at that point, even though we're, I wish we could say we came to a conclusion and here's how we solve uncertainty uh, or here's the solution. We could play that, we can play that, that 10 second clip over and over and over. And I think we're going to be able to do that in 2025, 24, 25, 26, 27. I think we, it, I, I think that John pretty much summed it up there. I think so too. And what's interesting for those of you that don't follow John on LinkedIn, do it. Follow him on Instagram, follow him on X, formerly Twitter, um, <laughs> all of those. Because what's fascinating is to see how quickly things change for John, because John's one of the top future strategists in the world, right? And we were lucky to have him on, and, and that little clip just shows you how brilliant he is. Um, but if you watch his stuff, he would probably give you some new stuff today that he didn't even have two weeks ago. Oh, uh, absolutely. And, and one of the things that stuck with me, Ira, that I remember um, him sharing with us was he's not going to write books anymore. Do you remember him saying that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because books become outdated way too fast. And so he's trying to think of ways, instead of launching the next book, of how does he launch the next codification of John Sane's wisdom in the best way possible to reach the most people possible so that it can continue to evolve and change and be dynamic. So I can't wait to see what he comes up with with that. Um, but it's just fascinating to hear him talk because... If you're, if you're other than geeks, geezers, Googleization, if you're wanting to stay on top of what are the things I need to know around the future of work, you need to follow John on those channels. Yeah. And so, you know, we, it's, it's hard just a uh, little, little, uh, about a year ago, um, uh, you know, short of a few days, um, our first guest was Stephen Kotler. 
um, a, a kind of amazing guest. I mean, he's highly highly respected, you know, best-selling author, um, you know, what what at the forefront of flow research, you know, his company's flow research, talking about that. So here's a, here's a short clip of that. And then we're going to move into what was one of our, our follow-up guests. Um, but they're with him and Chip Comley, uh, so many similarities. Um, and again, both, uh, both at the forefront of, of how our viewpoint of life is changing. When I use the term wisdom, wisdom is an actual defying neurobiological trait. We, it's about 12 different structures of the brain working together. It, uh, I'll talk a lot about expertise and wisdom. Expertise is all the stuff you learn consciously, right? I'm reading a book about Ponce de Leon and I'm learning about the fountain of youth. Wisdom is all the stuff I'm learning unconsciously. So Jason, Ira and I are interacting for the very first time and we're picking up subtle non-conscious signals. Oh, he's friendly. Oh, he doesn't like this topic. Oh, all that, all that stuff. That's wisdom. And they're stored in different areas of the brain. So I'm, I'm going to shoot right into chips because it, it, it was very similar, totally separate interviews, conversations, but, we, but it was also a similar concept of wisdom and aging and experience and performance. Well, I define wisdom as metabolized experience. So how you have taken your life lessons and learned from them that leads to distilled compassion. Because actually the first part of that metabolized experience, if that's all it was, that could make you savvy, not, not necessarily wise. Wise all the way back to the Greek days was considered a social good you know, for the common good. So there's an element of if you take your metabolized experience, your life lessons, and then you start applying them and helping other people learn from them and supporting others in compassionate ways, then that's what wisdom is. There's so much to unpack just in under a minute of those conversations, because we're, we're so, you know, we, we talk so much about intelligence. You know, we talk about IQ, emotional intelligence, adaptability intelligence, agile intelligence, um, uh, physical intelligence. Uh, which we talked about last week with John Gomes. I keep bringing him, his name up as well. Uh, it, it's amazing. Um, but it also has to do with, you know, can you be wise um, or do you have to have years of experience um, to get there? And then, you know, in, in a labor shortage, I mean, going in a shift, and I'm certainly one of those baby boomers, that, although I'm not retiring, um, it, is that feel that they're being pushed out, that they're not part of, the organization anymore. And it's beyond just knowledge. It used to be how do we capture their knowledge, what they know, but now it's how do we capture their wisdom? That's right. And and part of that wisdom is understanding that it, like Stephen Collar said, it actually is a neurological trait and that it gets stronger over time. I think one of the things both of them, Chip and Stephen, did for me that was a good reminder is I think often we have this tendency to think when it comes to cognitive abilities and the brain that once we get past like the 30s, that all of a sudden things are just on a steady decline, right? And they shattered that myth. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. That dendritical branching, neural pathways, um, certain types of skills like wisdom get better and crystallize more with age. And so workplaces should be thinking about how how can we set things up to continue keeping for example 70 year olds still interested and maybe they're not working the quote unquote typical 40 hours a week but maybe they they're given it. 10 hours a week <laughs> right <laughs> yeah I, I wish i was working only 40 hours a week <laughs> right right um but just that that mindset shift of Yes, if, if people want to retire, absolutely, if that's what they want to do. But I think there's going to be a growing number of people as they as they get older that may still want to do certain things. They found that passion and interest. And if the I mean, if the workplace culture is one that's hard for them to leave, that there's going to be opportunities, hopefully, for them scale down the number of hours, but you're still making valuable contributions and things that are important to you. Um, and that's an exciting part of the future, I think, that that we'll start to see come to pass. Yeah, well, that, that goes directly back uh, to gig jobs because now there's that opportunity. You don't have to get a job with an employer. So there's gig jobs. It goes back to autonomy. So, yep. um, you know, it's not only young people want their autonomy, um, older 
you know, baby boomers, uh, seniors, want their autonomy too, but they still have contributions to give back. And it's also about living the why. So, I mean, it, it keeps crossing over. These themes just cross over. Um, here's another one from uh, Stephen. I can't remember which why I picked this, but it's right ahead of one from John Gomes and Zach Mercurio. So probably leads into that. I have spent years, decades at this point, talking to CEOs about flow, peak performance, their companies, their organizations. And we spend, I, I got to say, at least 50% of every conversation I've ever had has been on hiring and training, which seem to drive more CEOs crazy than almost anything I know. And as a CEO, I totally emphasize, um, or not as an executive director, um, I have a different CEO now, um, former CEO, now executive director. Um, my point is that in talking to CEOs about business in the 21st century, I always hear two things. I, I hear, God, I want creative employees, innovative employees, because I want to keep pace with the rate of change and competition's kicking my butt. And how do we do that? And the other thing that I hear is I need empathetic employees and I need empathetic employees from a psychological safety. I want to build great teams. They got to function well together. Teams are at the heart of great businesses without psychological safety, without empathy. You can't do it. And then the mantra of 21st century business over and over and over again is customer centric thinking. And how can you think like your customers without empathy? My point is well-trained over 50 year olds are the ideal workforce of the 21st century. We are literally, HR departments are literally laying off right now in droves for really stupid ideas. Everybody they actually need to thrive in the 21st century, but it's not indiscriminate 50 year olds that you wanna be hiring. You need 50 year olds who actually have solved the crisis of identity, match fit, forgiveness, have trained up creativity, have trained down physical fragility and trained down risk aversion. And if you get that right, you are talking about a business, an HR business revolution in terms of who we're hiring and who we need uh, going forward in the 21st century. Speechless. It's like <laughs> right there's the recipe for the types of folks that you need, and obviously, you know, we need diver we need a lot of diversity. But uh, you know, his point there being a really important one for leaders to hear is don't just automatically think in those windows of ages sometimes when it comes to who you're laying off because like he said you may be inadvertently laying off some of the most important people in your organization if you're only looking at that component so he was the fat first guest we had and then john gomes was the the most recent and the last guest we had here's what he had to say this notion of fail fast learn fast is very sloppy in terms of what most organizations mean by it. They don't mean that at all. They mean, don't fail, succeed, you know, but do it quickly. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a great line, um, and more than a line, but it, there is so much truth to that. And, um, and again, that's, I, I think when you talk about startups, I mean, most people look at startups are young entrepreneurs, and yet, that's exactly what a lot of retiring boomers are doing. And now Gen X, uh, as they're in their 50s, are starting to think about their, I, I put my time in and now I'm going to do what, what I want to do. And I'm going to, we're, we're going to have a startup. Absolutely. A startup and, yep. and in many ways, I would think, you know, for, for older entrepreneurs, because there is that distilled wisdom <clears throat> that the ability to, avoid certain types of mistakes and understand certain types of risks can actually help them actually potentially move faster, make decisions faster um, than maybe some of the younger counterparts too. So next up is Paul Zach. Uh, Neuros was our, uh, well, it wasn't our first neuroscience. He was actually our second. Uh, Gabriella was our first. Um, but, but Paul had um, a great comment too. Um, I think this is, He's going to talk about here, uh, similar that the war, the war for talent's over, <laughs> and we lost. The it. war for talent is over, right? Talent has won because we have record low unemployment rates. There are no more babies, right? We've got to actually create workplaces where people can really be satisfied, have a sense of accomplishment, professional growth, personal growth. All this is really important, particularly for younger people, but for everybody. So I think part of that is we're going to see this employment move to the workplaces that have better cultures, 
And then the next question below that, the neuroscience question is, what does a great culture look like? The war for talent is over and he's right. Talent did win. And, and I think it's only going to continue. I'd love to hear your prediction on this, Ira, but I think in the future, um, that's only going to continue to accelerate that the amount of power, the leverage that high quality human talent has in the marketplace, I think is just going to become even more valuable um, moving forward. What do you think? Yeah, well, I don't want to be, I, and most people have followed me over the years, have heard me say this over and over again, and, and, and I've said this, I mean, the labor markets have shifted, the numbers just aren't there. Um, and while there's people worrying about finding a job and what AI is going to do and change my skills and there's not going to be enough work to get done, the fact of the matter is, is our labor market has just continued to shrink. Um, we have more younger people and more older people, uh, even if you're still active and thriving and working, um, our bodies don't always keep up. And although we're getting better at it and the quality of life is, is there, we, you know, if, if people can afford it, they like to travel. And if they can't afford it, they need health care. Uh, that's, that's simply the mm -hmm. case for almost anybody over 60. Uh, and, and so, but we need, we need more healthcare workers. We need more uh, hospitality workers, um, teachers, we need more teachers for, for young. I mean, you look at the, the two dependent um, parts of the pop segments of the population. Uh, we need more teachers. We need better teachers. We need more healthcare. We need more caregivers. Um, and then we almost go back to that. <laughs> after you hit 60 or 65. We need healthcare mm -hmm. workers, we need mentors, we need caregivers. But then for people who can't afford it, uh, people like to travel. When you travel, you need people that take care of things. Um, and, you know, wherever it is, whether it's getting you there by air, whether it's taking, you know, if you drive, you need people in, in convenience stores and hotels. And um, so we're, we're not, we're not, technology hasn't solved all those problems yet. Um, but there's also some, there's a lot of new jobs. We, we were talking before the show about prompt engineers and, and things. I mean, there's new jobs that are popping up all the time and, and constantly evolving. So uh, I agree with that. Let's keep going. We got a lot, we're only going to cover a, a couple of these. And I was just pulling out some of the highlights. So we heard from Paul, oh, Zach, we can't let Zach go. I think that this was one of my favorite moments all year. What gets in the way of leaders caring? What gets in the way of us caring for one another and how can we learn the hard skills to care? Uh, we have processes and procedures and practices for everything else in organizations, but what genuinely matters to human beings. And so my goal with this book, it's going to be called, uh, well, I haven't even said. So he, he was talking about his new book, but, um, and I thought that was, the, he, the, I must have another one here. When he talks about that mattering matters, mat mattering at work, but it's like, what what are the skills? I mean, I, I remember, and I, I use this because this was about 20 years ago that somebody told me that they wanted me to um, recommend an empathy course to, um, you know, to, to my clients. Because we thought we were talking even back then how important it was with emotional intelligence. And that's what empathy was, was being able to walk in somebody else's shoes. But it was an um, it, it was basically a self-taught asynchronous online course that that you would learn about empathy you watch a couple of videos you take a test and it's like okay now i'm empathy <laughs> <laughs> yep you know for for zach we i know you mentioned this earlier we had him on twice he was that good he had a phrase that I have used probably more than any other phrase from a guest uh, since I've been part of GGG with you. And I always attribute it to him, but it was his phrase when he said, nothing matters to someone who feels like they don't matter. Well, fundamentally. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like fundamentally, we can't expect people to care about their OKRs, KPIs, all of the stuff that's important to the business unless they feel like they matter. And that was just such a, a powerful statement from him that I think speaks volumes even outside of work life too, that we can't expect people to care about what's going on in school if they feel like they don't matter, that we can't expect them to care what's going on in politics if they feel like they don't matter. It's just a really good rallying call to remember at the core of everything, every single one of us wants to feel like we matter. 
Yeah, and that goes again goes back to John's comment last week. Uh, you know uh, about you know mindset is how we make how someone makes sense of the world, and if it makes sense, then what you're telling me to change doesn't make sense. <laughs> So just giving somebody an opportunity. Let's let's keep going here. We we have I want to get in as many of these as we can, and this fits into some of the challenges that we face. This is from Paul Allen, um, his senior VP at uh, Telus Health. Uh, they have the mental health index. What we found is about forty percent of working individuals, and again, it was a little higher in those under forty, uh, are experiencing this in one way or another. You know, there's procrastination. There's you know difficulty taking in to new information. There's difficulty completing uh, important tasks, although you want to. It's it's it, it is fairly significant. Okay. And I'm going to just keep. I'm going to tie in a couple here. Um, because these were all um, similar things. So we're, we're going to hear from Jasmine Bellamy now, and Jasmine's uh, a VP at Reebok. Our work manager has more impact or equal to, or more impact on our, um, our mental well-being than like our spouses. Like this is reality. And so if that is reality, how do we transform this system so that we get the best out of humans so they're not burning out, that they're not uh, checking out so that we can actually still um, maximize the output of our company, knowing that scarcity is not our problem anymore? The most startling finding, at the Ara, you mentioned you've looked at quite a lot of our research. The one that scares me the most, uh, you mentioned the, the, the number on how many employees actually feel... Uh, that they're connected to the culture of the organization. The, the one that scares me the most is when we actually pass that number by leaders and individual contributors. So the individual contributors were about 17 to 18% and leaders were at 39%. So there's a 22 odd percent gap. My problem is not the 22% gap. My problem is the 39%, only 39% of leaders feel that they're connected to the culture of their organization. I don't know, I don't know where to start. <laughs> Just the three of those could be been topics for an, each of them for an hour show, which they were. So we, we hope everybody goes back and looks at the archives. But Right. And leaders have a lot on their plate. I guess for me, the thing is, <clears throat> you would think with how much we've talked about employee engagement, culture over the years, how much it's been researched, that it's vastly improved. It asks for some organizations, but by and large, most organizations are still struggling with the same things. And that last one there to say that 39% of leaders, only 39% feel connected to their culture. Um, that's startling. Um, and we, we do need to treat it more just like Zach Mercurio said, we've got processes and things for improvement of all the other aspects of the business from product development to how we treat and take care of customers to our revenue operations. It's time that we develop a systematic set of ways of thinking, nurturing, guiding, designing healthy workplace cultures for your people and understanding that what might work for one organization may not work for another. Um, but it has to become something that's more at the forefront of us actually devoting dollars, time, energy, meetings, all of the other stuff that we do for other operations, we've got to do it for culture too. Yeah, let's hear from uh, Gabriella Kellerman. Um, and she is the co-author of a new book called Mindset. I believe it was Mind is it Mindset. I'm drawing a blank on what the name, we had so many books here. Um, but she um, uh, she's the uh, CEO of Better Up Labs, I believe. Is it, or is it time? This is not the first time it's been hard for people to cope with a labor transformation. It's not even the first time it's been hard for people to cope with a labor transformation while companies have existed. Yeah, Tomorrow Mind was, was the book. But uh, again, just, um, you know, a neuroscientist, um, she's worked with one of your, one of your favorite psychologists um, and co-authored the book. And, uh, and uh, again, it was, it was, Outstanding. I mean, I, I think I have 20 clips just from her her episode. That's right. Marty Seligman is that psychologist. Um, he was the, the discoverer of learned helplessness. And we talked a lot about that this year, that how many people feel the learned helplessness in terms of their work, feeling like, why is it worth it if I speak up or do anything because things aren't going to get better? 
and that we want to avoid that, that we want to continue trying to make workplaces better for people. Yeah, we're, we're going to, unfortunately, as, as I knew, we we're only going to get through a portion of these. There, there's one or two real quick ones here. They're only a few seconds each. I think this is the one from uh, John Sani. But now that AI is arriving, we realize that the skills we once had and prioritized are becoming irrelevant. And so the panic is not so much about AI. The panic is about the un- inability to develop new skills. Yeah, and we we talked about that, you know, so much. And again, the, the theme of this and 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 the anxiety that it's producing, um, you know, with well-being and mental health, and uh, on top of all the other issues that are social issues that are going on. We also, I, I don't want to neglect this, and I said this in the beginning. I thought I I moved these down, but we had an opportunity. We had some interesting panels. We had a remote work panel in the beginning of the year. Uh, we had Jeff Abbott from Avanti. We had Kate Lister, and uh, who's Gad Levinen, and Gad Levinen, yeah, um, from Burning Glass Institute. And and then Kate's been, you know, she's been talking about remote work since it was called telecommuting. Uh, so so uh, and, and you know she's she's got uh, workplace. Uh, her her company's got incredible incredible data. But then we also had four um, uh, panels with uh, Odeon Capital conversations. So uh, let me just play two clips here. And then uh, actually one of the concluding ones I have here is from there. Well, you know, if you want one prediction for 2024, I think it's going to be a year of resolution. I think it's going to be a year in which we get to grips with major problems politically, economically, financially, and in in terms of where and how this economy is growing. So I think we're going to have a recession. I think we're going to have a very volatile political period. Um, and we have two major wars, one in Europe and one in the Middle East that, you know, could easily slide into something much bigger than we expect. So we have hope, and we <laughs> have resolution, <laughs> and we have despair, which um, was perfect. <laughs> That's right. That's why they're so good together, the yin and the yang there. And obviously none of us know, but so far, somehow, I remember when we were thinking about predictions for 2023 ira most everyone thought yes there's going to be a recession quote unquote we will dip into an actual recession in 2023 and it didn't happen um so just goes to show even with our best data and information sometimes that the world is changing the economy is changing so quickly that even some of the ways we look at measure those things may not be the best predictors moving into the future for what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and we want to leave um, everyone. And again, there's so many more here. Uh, I'm going to be putting these. They, I, we, these are all out there. Uh, please check, check out the YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Ira Wolf. But I will p- be putting out these as a refresher. I'm going to try to put these together uh, in 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 uh, topic through themes, a kind of sh- couple short videos to watch because they're they're incredible the excerpt, uh, their incredible advice, you're talking about wisdom. Um, we have all this wisdom and and we still haven't figured out how to how to close that gap. How do we get it out there? But fortunately, we have them recorded uh, and we can, can share them uh, over and over again. But I apologize uh, to all the guests. We weren't able to kind of pull out their highlights, um, but it's been a remarkable year and there's just far too many. I mean, once Jason Pfeiffer had a number of Super good ones. John uh, John Sani had the Michael Platt. Um, uh, I, again, the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, we're so grateful to have all, had all these people. But um, please go back and and listen to them as as I did uh, to pull some of these out uh, because we've got almost 400 shows. And again, uh, you know, every week we we talk about everything from autonomy to gig jobs to labor markets to empathy to vulnerability to authenticity to love in the workplace uh, and how it's changing uh, leadership and hopefully making it better but uh, unfortunately we've got to wrap up for today but as we look forward to uh, 2024 we've got a an important announcement to share with all of you jason yeah it's been absolutely it's it's a bittersweet moment for me right now, because after nearly three incredible years with Geek Skeezers and Googleization, the time has come for me to embark on a new journey 
that I'll be starting in 2024. And so that means I'll be stepping away from the podcast in 2024 as I help lead the launch of the podcast at Human Works 8, where I do some consulting. And so as I'll be embarking on that, it's a bittersweet day uh, to be not saying goodbye, but saying see you later um, as co-host heading into 2024 um, on the show with you, Ira. Jason, I, I know I speak for all our listeners when I say that uh, your insights uh, and our chemistry has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, you've brought not just your expertise, your background, which are completely different than mine, uh, your insights, but also warmth and humor to uh, every conversation. Uh, and uh, quite a few times you filled in in my absence, so you'll be deeply missed. Well, this was an incredible journey and a chapter that I'm grateful for and so thankful for our friendship as well that continues on in the future. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege and and for you to be open and willing to let me come on as co-host, um, you know, from when you started this. I've cherished every conversation, every laugh, every moment of learning and growth. And in fact, it's been like getting an advanced university education every single week. Um, from getting to ask questions and learn from you and these incredible leaders. And so um, while I'm excited about the future um, of things, I'm also going to hold on to the dear memories and friendships uh, that were formed here. And just like I said, I don't believe in goodbyes. This is just to see you later. So on behalf of Googleization Nation and Jerry, who our families became friends through this, we wish you all the best. Uh, you'll always be part of the Geek Skeezers and Googleization family and welcome to come back anytime. Uh, to our listeners, stay tuned. Uh, while we're sad to see Jason go, we're not going anywhere. The journey continues. In fact, we're probably just getting started. We'll be back in 2024. I'm taking off uh, the first two weeks, but we will be back uh, mid-January and uh, we've got some amazing guests coming back on. We got some enticing conversations and quite a few surprises. Uh, here's to new beginnings and endless possibilities. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll be back soon with more exciting content in 2024. And I'll definitely be tuning in. Thanks to everyone who's been part of this journey with me. Keep challenging the status quo. And remember, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.